This program is brought to you by Emory University. I have a confession to make. Until I came to Salman's archive, which I started looking at at some point last year, I hadn't realized that I'd been looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> <laughs> love was everywhere in his archive. Ben Johnson told you in setting up the topic for this symposium that we had found the words for the topic in his essay, February 1999, written 10 years after the fatwa, in which he says, love feels more and more like the only subject. As I, but as I said yesterday in my remarks as we were looking at the opening of Salman's archive, Love seems to be everywhere in his writing, from the very beginning, and it's all over the archive. There are journal notes about looking for love, looking to be loved, to be lovable, about writing from love, writing as an act of love, reflection on characters who had been redeemed by love and forgiveness, love of children, love of his own children, and all kinds of love, not just couple love. There's the love of people for their rulers, for their prince, the prospect of love in the future, a future with or without love. And then I found this one page, it was a fragment, which had a series of fascinating collocations. I want to read you from this. Here he says, and these just seem to be random notes that Salman's taking. They appeared in an unfiled box of material. Uh, <laughs> I actually don't remember where it's from. So. <laughs> and there it was, this page, which ends by saying, the opposite of hatred is love. The opposite of tyranny is love. The opposite of censorship is love. The opposite of evil is love. The opposite of politics is love. The opposite of war is love. The opposite of God is love. Would you say a little more to explain this? <laughs> Well, as I told you, I've forgotten writing it, so <laughs> God knows what I was talking about. But first, I just, well, I'd just like to say, first of all, you know, I thought it's been such fun listening to, the, to my two pals and thank them for showing up. I mean, that's an act of love that they showed up for me. Um, and I thought, you know, to quote Orwell, it was double plus good. I mean, see, I wrote all these notes. So I can have an argument with them. Um, one of the things I thought, actually, I, when, when Deepa was talking about being consoled by the fact that I was having a hard time while she was having a hard time, it reminded me, a long time ago, in the British satirical review called Beyond the Fringe, there was, uh, I think, Peter Cook impersonated the then British Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, explaining um, conservative social policy in a way that would be understandable to many Republicans, I think, he said, it is a policy. He said, he said, he said the thing about the conservatives is we believe that there's always someone worse off than yourself. And it is the policy of the Conservative Party to make sure that this state of affairs is maintained. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, also, I wanted to say that Christopher didn't mention, but one of the things I feel proud of is having helped come up with the title for his forthcoming memoir. Can we talk about our stupid game? Yeah. yeah. Oh, we, it's Chris, a stupid game. So. It's a very good game. Actually, it's like a, the thing about this game is it's like a computer virus. When I tell you this game, you will all fall silent and stop listening because you'll be trying to, you'll be trying to play it. 
and the game is the titles of books and movies and works of art that don't quite make it. As, for example, Mr. Zhivago. <laughs> <laughs> or, um, or The Big Gatsby. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah. Or Good, good Expectations. Yeah. <laughs> Hemingway, Hemingway, is, Hemingway is very good. Um, for Whom the Bell Rings. Um, um, farewell to Weapons. Um, and, um, Portrait of a Woman. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ms. Bovary. <laughs> um, and the one that, you see, Joseph Heller inspired, which I, I can't remember which of us suggested, but Hitch 22. <laughs> um, which is the title of his <laughs> memoir. <laughs> so you see, it's not such a silly name. Also, um, two days in the life of Ivan Denizabeth. <laughs> uh, yes. And if you take one letter off a famous book by Kurt Vonnegut, you get Laughter House 5. <laughs> um, so anyway might this be the time no uh, uh, we could go on we could go on <laughs> there's a Stratfordian element to another game but another game would we this be the moment the games yeah. something has to be left to the imagination okay um, can I, I get I you to talk about love mm? <laughs> yeah, yeah. well can I just say one thing about irony <laughs> Since he was talking about irony. I remember once being at a conversation with one of the other people there was a filmmaker, Wim Wenders. Um, and he had recently married an extremely devout wife. And Wim tends to take his worldview from the women he's with. And so Wim had suddenly become very devout. And he was speaking about how artists should now dispense with irony. That irony was, in fact, dangerous because people could misunderstand it. And that we must all learn to speak much more directly and clearly and without such you know, trickery as the ironic entering our lexicon. And I, I said to him, excuse me, Mr. Venders, can I just check that you are, in fact, the Vim Venders who directed Wings of Desire? <laughs> and, and he confirmed that he was. And I said, well, if I remember that, that um, film, there are, there are angels on the architecture you know, um, looking down upon Earth and, and the lives of human beings and wishing that they could have those lives. And are you suggesting to me that we should understand this film non-ironically? <laughs> and he said, yes. So I said, in fact, there are angels on the architecture, is that right? And they are wishing that they were human beings. And he said he felt that that was so. And this so upset me that later on, when I was writing the novel Ground Beneath Her Feet, I put Vim and his wife into the novel under the, the he, was, he, he has the name in the novel, Otto Ving, <laughs> spelled, of course, W-I-N-G. And he and his wife are known collectively as the Vings of Desire. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's, it's a great law that when you make something absolutely clear, nobody notices it. <laughs> so Vim has never, never to this day noticed <laughs> that he is, in fact, a character in the book, uh, even though you would think. Anyway, that's sort of about love. Everything's <laughs> so, about love. It's about desire, anyway. Uh, anyway, there we go. Sorry, your questions. You're talking about desire. I wasn't going. I was going to ask you this question at the about the twenty-minute lull point. You know how every conversation goes into a bit of a lull, the twenty minutes. But you've led me to desire before my time. Oh, okay. So oh, well, I'm happy. I'll ask you this. That's something um, to be said for that. <laughs> <laughs> An item that didn't make it to the exhibit, but which was one of my favorites. And this has to do with sex, so oh. stay tuned. Mm. Salman was actually nominated for, the, for a piece of writing uh, for the Bad Sex Awards. It's a badge of honor. <laughs> <laughs> and your response to um, the nominators is, it's a thing of beauty. It's funny. And he regrets his inability to attend the occasion. And he hopes that uh, uh, the judgeship committee has had plenty of experience of bad sex, which would lead them to, to a be wise, experts. Uh, to be experts <laughs> and to be guided to a wise decision. <laughs> <laughs> would you tell us about the relationship between um, 
well? Love and sex? Oh, well, it's close. <laughs> <laughs> really? It may not be... It may not be actually true to say that you can't have one without the other, but, but it helps, you know, on the whole. Um, the thing about the Bad Sex Award is that it's a, it seems to be a particularly English disease. Um, and, and, and I suspect it's actually an award in which all you have to do is write about sex at all, and you're immediately nominated for the Bad Sex Award. Um, it, it's, a, it's an award given by people who would prefer not to think about sex. It reminds me there's a wonderful moment in a play by the British playwright Alan Akebourne in which it's called Bedroom Farce, in which one of the characters, woman, is complaining to her mother-in-law that she and her husband are not getting on. And, and uh, the mother-in-law, who is fond of her, says, what's the, tr what's the trouble, dear? Is it, is it S-E-X? And, and she says, yes, it is. And, and mother-in-law gives her this wonderfully wise advice. She says, well, as, as my mother always said to me, dear, every time S-E-X rears its ugly head, you should close your eyes before you see the rest of it. <laughs> and I always feel that the judges of the Bad Sex Award are like her. You know, really. Anyway, I, lived, I didn't win. My sex wasn't bad enough. <laughs> and rightly as it added, close your eyes and think of England. Because <laughs> there's something about the climate, perhaps. Yeah. No sex, yeah. please. They're, We're British. Well, it's the French. British gritting the remains of their tea. The English. <laughs> yeah. Embarked on the, on the grim business of passing on their genes. I can't remember who it was, but I can't, I can't remember who said it, but Christopher will tell you that, that you know, the, the French have love affairs and the English have hot water bottles. <laughs> <laughs> and woolies. <yes. laughs> Twin so, sets. Yeah. But this, this was, um, um, you actually write about writing seriously about sex no, I mean, I, you in, know, in, truth, in the Moors last time. Truthfully, I had been very, in my early, for a long time in my career, I had written virtually nothing about sex. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, I mean, in Midnight's Children, there's, there's obviously there's plenty of sex, but it's all off stage. You know, there's very, very little um, actual description, I mean, except there's a comic moment in which you know, Amina Sinai, the, the, who becomes the mother of the main character, who has just remarried, you know, her husband, who is going to be the father, but, and she is finding it very difficult to fall in love with him, and so she decides to fall in love with a different bit every day, mm -hmm. you know, to choose little, some aspect of him to fall in love with on that particular day. And, and, and there's um, one part that she There's one part that she's up. finding unable to fall in love with, yes, it's true. <laughs> 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 and that's more or less the only overt sexual... Try as she may. Try as she may, exactly. <laughs> and she does try. She's a good wife. Um, so when I got to the Moors Last Side, thereabouts, I mean, even there, 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 is a, there is a love scene in it, but it's a very comic love scene. And the way it's written about is it's being narrated by somebody who can't tell you. Because, you know, the, the scene is about the, the, the first person narrator is telling you about the moment his mother and father first made love. And of course, you know, as we all know, your parents aren't supposed to have sex, you know, um, except maybe on the one occasion that you were conceived. Um, but otherwise, no. You know? um, and so he's trying to describe this as the narrator of the novel. And the whole passage is about how he can't describe it, because he keeps leaving the verbs out. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know so it, it's written kind of first he and... But it has a lot, but it has a lot of, uh, I can say this unironically, spice. Spice, because it all takes place on pepper sacks pepper and the spice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, but it's, it's, so, you know, he, he says first he peppery and, with a hint of and then she. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then he again and uh, she again and then very quickly and then for a long time. Someone has to do it. And slowly. And, uh, he just can't do it. So, so really there was, no, there was no sex in my books until this last one. And, and, and uh, what happened in The Enchantress of Florence is that I found myself describing a world, 16th century, both in India and in Renaissance Italy, which was very openly hedonistic, you know, in, in which there was a, uh, I mean, it was happening all over, you know, so unlike today. And, <laughs> and, and so I thought I've got to actually take it on because it's such a central aspect of the world I'm describing. Um, 
so I, yeah, so I did. It's very hard to do because it, it, it actually the, the thing that's true about the bad sex thing is that it's very, very easily to do, easy to do it badly, and particularly if you start if you start trying to be at all pornographic, you know, if if you start being at all kind of lubricious, <laughs> um, it gets cripplingly embarrassing at once. You know? um, so funny is one way. Um, that, that, that's, that's quite effective. Comedy, comic sex scenes are usually more successful than non-comic ones, um, because most sex is comic. <laughs> it's true. Not, not always intentionally, but... <laughs> A lot of writers want to write about sex very badly, and they do. <laughs> but that, that, that leads me to something that I know I want to ask all of you about. And that's the connection between um, the couple love with which we relate the idea of sex, usually, um, and the bigger love, the eros and agape distinction that people make. You know, the love between the two and other bigger kinds of love. Do you talk about that? Everybody? Well, I think, you know, I th actually think you know, looking at this, all these old papers has obliged me to do what I don't very often do, which is to sort of look backwards at, at what I've done rather than forwards towards what I'd like to do. And, and one of the things I think is that, the, that romantic love in my books doesn't get a very good deal. But, you know, the, the path of romantic love doesn't run very smooth tends to go wrong in all kinds of, I hope, interesting ways. Um, but the stuff that I think does, is there and works better is almost every other kind of love. You know, the, the love of, the love of uh, place, the love of, of parents for children, the love of, mm -hmm. of well, family, you know, um, the love of friends and, uh, you know, loyalties, those kinds of things. I, mean, I think those things in, tend to, I, this is my hypothesis since yesterday, so it's a working hypothesis. And, <laughs> and please feel free to disagree. Um, but I think that that's, it's, I think it's true that what happens in these stories is that, is that the love that endures is, is something other than the romantic sexual love between men and women. And that tends to spectacularly decompose. Well, Christopher writes about it too, that um Love suffers in retrospect, is better in prospect, something like that. Yes, I think the, the idea, the romantic idea is the one of um, when your thoughts, as, as the poet says, turn to thoughts of love, when you sort of would like to be in love, it's, uh, or in love with the idea of love. Um, elusive, always perhaps to be sought, almost disappointing to be pinned or uh, the next. Um, winding back at, at only one spool here, um, our common friend, mutual friend, Ian McEwen, wrote a very beautiful article, I thought, just after the terrible assault on American civil society in September 2001. And he, he, it was very difficult for, for fiction writers to come up with something no one had thought of or particularly pointed out before. Someone managed it, Martin Amos managed it in different ways. Ian did the following. He, he looked at all the last messages that those who knew they were going to die, those who didn't, weren't just obliterated, but those who understood that their death was coming, they had a few minutes, usually with a cell phone, what they said. And he went through all of them. And you can probably see where I'm going with this. He said they all ended with the same three words. I think there were no exceptions to that, in point of fact. And he said that that was probably the best revenge. Well, Deepa, you two, Deepa Mehta has made this wonderful film called The Republic of Love based on Carol Shields' novel. And one of the lines I remember from it, well, I don't know, it's not a line so much as a sort of summary that you have to, um, you need to love and you can only live and be fully alive if you can risk being disenchanted by the idea of love. Mm. What I remember of the screenplay, which, uh, which resounds with me, is that uh, what Carol Shields said is, um, uh, there's a pot for every pan. <laughs> I thought that was rather lovely. And, uh, and the whole aspect of the, that 
you fall out of love. And I think that's fascinating. And romantic love ceased to exist for me when I stopped reading Barbara Cartland. <laughs> you mean you've read Barbara Cartland? Of course I did. <laughs> and Georgette Hare, and all the mills and boons in the world. <laughs> Guilty as charged, too. Really? Yes, you don't grow up. Well, certainly, we, we, get a, we get our idea of love from Hallmark cards. We get our idea from films. Um, and it seems to me that all three of you talk about love in all sorts of big ways. Um, Christopher, you say that life is un incomplete unless love, poverty, and war have been yes. experienced. Um, that, can just those three? that life is complete if love, poverty, and war? It's incomplete without. You haven't lived unless you've had probably a hard experience of love, poverty, and war. Mm -hmm. um, but at any rate, the experience, yes, you wouldn't know what you were writing about if you didn't. Um, but, but one must be aware, just as some people say poverty is ennobling and war can be liberating, and those things can be true, though they're not generally. So I think one has to see what the dangers of love are. I mean, it, it used to impressed me very much when I was little and I was being told that I had to love an, a non-entity, an impersonal uh, force with a capital, or I might mind lowercase g, as the name. This was compulsory love. I find the idea of compulsory love rather creepy, don't you? But Especially very... compulsory love of someone who you're also bound to fear. This is the germ of sadomasochism. It, it, Mm -hmm. to me. It's present in all, in all fideistic cults and in the very sickly work of C.S. Lewis on the four loves as he describes them. Um, you have this awful uh, sort of groveling uh, element which I, I don't think qualifies as love at all. A lot of people don't like to say the words I love you because they're afraid that if they say them they'll exorcise themselves. If you do love someone there are other ways of proving it than announcing it or writing them a sonnet on Valentine's Day, whatever it might be. It's, uh, and I think that's, that's a proper reticence. It, it uh, exemplifies some parts of the uncertainty principle. Don't jinx it by going on about it too much. Like sex, you'll know it when you see it. <laughs> so, so it's one of, my, one of the things that I've tried to um, look at in more than one novel, really. I, in, in, in The Enchantress, yes, but I think also in in the ground beneath her feet, you know, is the idea that we may be wrong about the nature of love. That, you know, when we, when we talk about love, we usually add to it all kinds of other related concepts, such as fidelity, durability, you know, etc., that it's supposed to go on for a long time, and it's supposed to be monogamous, and etc., etc. And it occurred to me that that might all be nonsense. That might just be a kind of comforting bourgeois, you know, domestication of love. Um, and, and that actually love might have more or less nothing to do with those things. It might be much more savage and, and uh, brutal and non-enduring, a thing that betrays itself, etc. It might actually be the kind of love that you find in high tragedy, the kind of love that you find you know, where you, you can't trust it. You know, it betrays itself and it betrays you, and it doesn't last, it explodes in your face, etc. So I thought, supposing you just to take away all these comforting half-truths about love and look instead at this much more, much harsher, tougher, bleaker thing, you know, which is related, of course, and maybe what I'm talking about is something much closer to passion than to love. But, um, but that, anyway, it seems to me it's worth at least considering the possibility that it might not be very nice love. Don't you think, um, I'm sort of listening to you guys, um, I think the thing about that's attractive about love is that somehow it's shared and you aren't there for alone. Hmm. But you can love without being loved, you know, I mean, it's a... But the un so? un unrequited love, painful, but still there. But it's so. with somebody. It's of somebody who might yeah. not, you know, who might not think you're very cool at all. But you think they are, <laughs> don't yeah, you? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Actually, just reminded me. This is slightly in a tangent, but thinking all this talk about love made me think I don't know why about Don Juan, and therefore Don Juan, and therefore Byron. Mm -hmm. Yes. And and one of the 
I just share this with you as a strange story. A friend of mine was researching Byron and, um, and was reading the correspondence at the time of the publication of Don Juan, um, written by the then British poet laureate Robert Southey. Now, Byron despised and detested Southey and often said what a crappy poet he was. And Robert Southey returned the compliment, you know, um, and thought that Byron was a piece of shit as well. <laughs> and, and, when, and when Don Juan came out, there's a letter which my friend found and sent to me a copy of, written by Southey to some friend of his, sort of a fulmination against this poem, you know, saying that it was evil and blasphemous and vile and disgusting, and so was its author, and, and he, it, the, at the height of the tirade, he says, this poem is so evil that it should not be called Don Juan, it should be called the Satanic Verses. <laughs> <laughs> and this is something I didn't know uh, at the time that I was writing, but I thought, I'll take it, you know? Sure. Uh, you know, me and Byron, I think that's just fine. <laughs> if that's, that's that's the team I wouldn't mind being on. So, so, anyway, there you are. And, and there's also, somehow, there's also, what is this thing? Oh, well, <laughs> that's another, yes. Well, it's, this is just the question of re-emphasis. You know, instead of the famous, what's this thing called love, you just re-emphasize it and it becomes, what's this thing called love? <laughs> 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 Which is less romantic. Yeah. No, I don't know. Like, if you just take the word love out of any well-known phrase or saying and put in, Hysterical sex, <laughs> as in hysterical sex is all you need. <laughs> hysterical sex is a many splendid thing. <laughs> My friend Who wrote the book Hitchens. of hysterical sex? Yeah. <laughs> it could grow on you too. All you need. You'll is be it. playing it later. I know. No, I, know I know you will. These uh, these are all computer viruses. Also. <laughs> um, but there's uh, you were saying earlier, Salman, that mm. we we tried. To bourgeoisify, domesticate the idea of love, attach it to the idea of fidelity, durability, and so on. And it occurs to me that I don't know that it's necessarily a bourgeois version. It sounds to me like trying to make a religion mm. or supplanting religion with love, with well, all the be. suggestions of transcendence. Well, that would be an improvement. Everlasting. <laughs> It wouldn't be perfect. <laughs> but yeah, I think if we could supplant religion with love, I'd go for that. I think it's very important that it be, so to say, contained. In other words, one on one at a time. Not trying to be funny. I mean, your daughter, your wife, perhaps your brother, but only the, there's arrows in pointing that direction. Um, intelligible, in, in proportion, um, useful. So, but when you're told you have to love your enemy, I don't see the point. That seems to be suicidal, especially considering the sort of enemies one actually has. No, anyway, I can't do it. I'm glad I can't because I hate them <laughs> and wish to encompass their destruction. But worse still, I think, as they do me, and I return the comment, but worse still, I think even more dangerous and sickly again, is that you have to love your neighbor or your, everyone as much as you love yourself. It's, it, it, I think it's a very horrible injunction. First, because it's impossible. I mean, no one can do it. It, it can't be achieved. So it's love finite? Yeah, so that um, it's totalitarian, because it, it is a commandment, but it cannot be obeyed. Therefore, you are always in the wrong. You're always guilty. You've always fallen short of it. You're, you should always be reproaching yourself. It's a very horrible suggestion. Um, and and it, it is, you can't walk around thinking, there goes another person I love just as my, I like my daughter. <laughs> I mean, it's also, it, it's, it's absurd until you think about its further implications, which are dictatorial and totalitarian and thought crime creating. So I think love should be reserved for people who are, know you well enough to either accept it from you or offer it to you. One of the um, great things about living in a city is the opposite of loving your neighbor, you don't have to know your neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in fact, it's preferable not yeah. to. Yes. Well, well let, let, let me ask you yeah. all then about love of the same and love of the different. Um, 
the theorist Michael Hart has been exploring the idea of love. He won't write a book about it. He'll talk about it in interviews because he says it's, it's just something that he's trying to work through. And he specifically um, looks at this biblical injunction to love thy neighbor. Mm. And he says that's, uh, that's dangerous, the idea of love of the same, um, which can translate into racism, right? Love of your own race, your own people, your own country can, can translate into that. Um, and the question that I have is, if you examine 20th century history, uh, most of the modern genocides are between neighbors. So maybe yeah. we need to look at developing better relationships with our neighbors. I know Salman's talked about this in the most last Sai. How is it that neighbor turns against um, neighbor? Well, that's a very, very fine line that you crossed there because it is argued by some biblical scholars that neighbor in both Old and New Testaments only means fellow member of the tribe. That is true. You're not supposed to love non-Jews in the same way. Um, for example, and that, that seems very clear in the Ten Commandments also. But on the, on, the, on the genocidal fraternal, there is a theory of Sigmund Freud's, which some of you I'm sure know. It's, the, it's called the, the narcissism, narcissism of the small, small difference. Differences. So that differences between people that are practically impalpable to you and me, um, such as the difference between a Hutu and a Tutsi in Rwanda, are the, all they really know about and all that they care about. And on that distinction, they're really prepared to kill. Um, I lived in Northern Ireland for a while. After a bit, I thought I could tell a Protestant from a Catholic by looking. They know immediately. It's all that matters to them. And they're willing to kill for it. For the love of God, in all cases, by the way. You could, you um, could look at it another way also. That murder, all murder, not just this kind of intercommunal murder. Murder is an intimate crime. It's relatively few murders are of the kind of shooting spree, you know, mass murder kind. Most, in most murders, the victim and the murderer know each other very well. Yes, they have shared love. Yeah, they might, they might live together, they might be siblings, they might be family members, they might be close friends. Almost, I mean, like 99% of murder is an intimate crime. It's a crime between people who know each other very, very well. And, and who might, in fact, be said to have the kind of relationship, a family relationship, a marriage, whatever. Um, to go from that to, for instance, you know, in, in Old Delhi in, in, in India, um, most of the time, Hindu and Muslim communities live not just side by side, but completely interpenetrated. You know? um, and yet, when this kind of communal violence breaks up, um, those are the people who begin to kill each other. You know, the people who, who kill your children are the people whose children were playing with your children yesterday. You know? mm -hmm. And, and it's that, that's one of the most mysterious things about this, the flip into hatred, you know, is that it, it's, it's, you don't hate people who are strangers to you because that creates a kind of indifference. You create the people who, you hate the people who live next door. You know, um, and, and when that hate bursts out of you, that's who you reach for the gun to kill. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a curious thing this, that love and hate are this, they're so closely tied together that just a flip of the coin can flip one into the other. And that's, mm. it, it seems to me that's very interesting as a, as a writer to, to examine. You it's, know, to, it's amazing too because we are the only species. It's the reason why we are a success to the extent we are that doesn't have any real genetic variation. I mean, all other species have very marked fluctuations uh, in size and in shape and in all, all kinds of, but the human beings are, if we were dogs, we'd all be the same breed. It's true, and that's what, what makes us efficient. And yet, with the help of things like religion and race theory and so on, it's possible to make the absolute maximum of the absolute minimum and to make it lethal. And of course that would hold for formerly married couples or Whatever neighbors, it might, yeah. neighbors, whatever it might be. I prefer to have, I mean, hate-hate relations with some people. Um, <laughs> I guess keep it on even keel. You know, I, I really don't like this and that. Have it clarified in the beginning. But, but when love goes bad, nothing goes worse than that. And that's the subject of Deepa Mehta's um, film Earth as well, which you were talking about earlier. The friendships that break down, the love that goes wrong. Yeah. Absolutely, I mean, you hate. The people you love, I mean, it, it, it's, 
that's when the disaster happens. And, uh, and sometimes you can't distinguish between that. That's what's scary. In Earth, for example, Ice Candy Man loves Aya so much, and the first person he hurts is her. And Sidwa talks about the pitiless face of love. Mm -hmm. And what? Oscar Wilde says, each man kills the thing he loves. Mm -hmm. And Philip Larkin, the, one of the least sentimental of all poets, and with the least sense of the likelihood of the survival of the soul of the spirit, says, what will remain of us is love. That, is love. The, the, the test you'll have to pass if you ever want to think of yourself in a transcendent will be, what did you do for love, as it were? Quite an exacting test, worth setting for yourself, probably. Mm -hmm. Well, Woody Allen talks about this. So, so, you know, you, you, you were talking before about love and death, and of course, one of the great examinations of love and death is Woody Allen's. Um, I always recall the great scene where Woody Allen played this young Russian soldier subsides onto a rug with a Russian princess. And the camera pans up to a clock showing one minute to 12, and then dissolves to the same clock showing one minute past 12. <laughs> <laughs> pans back down to a scene of absolute, you know, sensual mayhem. <laughs> and the Russian princess lying in sort of sated abandon says to him, Darling, you were wonderful. How do you come to be so good at love? And he says, well, I practice a lot on my own. <laughs> <laughs> Woody, Woody Allen's good on love. I, one of, yeah. I think I fell in love with him uh, reading his published fictional journal in which he has a line, should I propose to MJ, or it might have been JM, should I propose to JM, not until I find out what the initials in her name stand for. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight, we can do Woody Allen all night, but, yeah. my, but, my, but uh, Bertie Worcester says the same, if, it, if, if the Gwendolyn spells her name with a Y, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, wasn't it, I think I'm right in saying that it was well, you. Well, Gladys with a W, by the way. Was, no. it, was it not you, Mr. Hitchens, who criticized our previous president, Mr. Clinton, for his relationship with Jennifer Flowers? Yes, if, uh, Jennifer you, with a G. You should, you never, <laughs> run for your life. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, you know never, never trust a woman who can't spell yeah, her own name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, all right, all right. it's all in the details. Um, requited and unrequited love, you talked about that a little bit before. Um, I want you, Salman, in particular, to talk about um, failed love. You talk about that a great deal, actually. We have beautiful lines about defeated love being greater than the thing which defeats it. And I was wondering if I could ask you about, specifically about the relationship between your writing and readership and the failures that have taken place there, which might be a sort of unrequited love. So uh, say, for instance, some, some early writing um, and your experiences there um, and how your work was received. Well, I, don't know, I mean, I think with one exception, I've been quite lucky, really. <laughs> um, but it was a hell of an exception. It'd be the bad review. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, the bad review in the Persian Post. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Panned by the Tehran <laughs> Times. <laughs> no good, Tehran yeah, Times. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I hated it. <laughs> R, I, R. Couldn't, I couldn't pick it up. No, uh, exactly. AK. Yeah. Is it, who was it? Dorothy Parker who said, this is not a book that should be put down. It should be hurled across the room with great force. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I had, I had one or two of those. Um, no, look, it's, it's, you want people to like what you do. You know, I mean, it's, it, obviously, you write a book, you don't want people to not like it. You want everyone to like it. Um, but I think one of the things, leaving aside no. the, Sorry. not your point, no. no. I don't care whether they like it or not. I want no. them to love it, but otherwise they can go, <laughs> they can all go to hell. Yeah. No, no, no. He's a non-fiction writer. Yeah, he's a non-fiction writer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but a poet in it's, it's always difficult when people don't like what you write because there's a bit of you that makes that thinks, well, you obviously haven't read it properly or you misunderstood it or how can you be so dumb? You know? <laughs> um, but a 
thing that happens as you continue to publish books is that one of the things you notice is that not everybody is going to like what you do. That there are going to be people who, you know, because of their personal failings and, <laughs> and, 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 and malicious inclination and, uh, and bad taste and, and bad taste and are bad going taste. to prefer other Cerebral writers. Cerebral limitations. They, yes. yes. <laughs> they're, they're going to prefer other writers well, like, okay, this to yours. You know, um, and there's a point at which you decide that that's okay and that is the moment of freedom. You know, the, the moment at which you stop trying to be a crowd pleaser. That we, you just stop, you think, I'm, just, I'm doing this. You know? And actually, in my case, the moment which really helped was when I published um, my novel Fury, um, which was actually had the misfortune to be published on September the 11th, 2001. Um, not a very good day to publish a book. Not many people were having literary thoughts that day. And, you know, it was, anyway, the point about that book is it, it got probably the bumpiest critical reception that I've had for, I mean, ever, really. Um, and oddly, that was the thing, the point at which I thought, you know, I'm sorry you don't like it, but I'm going this way. You know, you decide at certain points as an artist that you know where you're going. You know, that, you, that there is a certain road that you think is the interesting road to be on, and you're going in that direction. You know? And if people could come along with you, that's excellent. You, know, you would rather that they did, and you would rather that they understood why you were going that way and that they liked the journey that you were taking. You'd prefer that. But if they don't, then you think, well, eh, you know, I'm still going this way. And that's the, it's, just, it's a point of freedom at that point. You, you, it's not that you don't care about the way in which people read you, you do care about it, but that you can't actually change the way you're writing as a result. You, know? um, you are who you are, in the immortal words of Popeye, the sailor man, you know, I am what I am, and that's, that's what, what I, I am. am. <laughs> you know, of course, also, also the statement from the top of Mount Sinai. Yes, exactly, it's a blasphemous association of Popeye the sailor am, man with am, Yahweh. Yeah, yeah, which, yeah. <laughs> which also means I am. <laughs> the, great um, I, the great I am. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I was sent, I have to tell you, after the fatwa, I got sent my favorite T-shirt, which sadly is lost now, which was written the phrase, blasphemy is a victimless crime. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I think the thing that happened with the Satanic Verses was obviously particularly in many ways galling because, you know, a lot of that, to put it simply, to have people from the community in which you'd set your novel marching down the streets of the city in which you'd set it, asking for it to be banned, is, you know, it's a very distressing thing to see. Um, and that's one of the things that happened. Um, I mean, my, much of the novel is, in fact, quite, I think, to my mind, a kind of sympathetic portrait of the condition of Muslim communities living as immigrants in East London. Um, and yet, those were the people marching, saying that it was in some way reprehensible. And of course, that's a, a failure of connection between, between book and reader that's, that was very painful. Um, I mean, more so in some way than the Ayatollah Khomeini, because frankly, his abilities as a literary critic were not ones that I revered. <laughs> um, um, also, you know, if, if, cra if, if crazy mullahs behave like crazy mullahs, it's not a surprise. You know, but if, if sort of as it were, ordinary people begin to behave in a way that's, that, that, that seems to echo the behavior of the crazy mullah, then you begin to worry. And it was upsetting. It was very upsetting. Would you mind if I usurped your position just for a second to ask him a question? Usurp away. As the, uh, as I'm the only non-subcontinental on this platform. And I, I wanted to ask you about love of country. Mm. All of you, actually. Mm. Uh, especially taking off, perhaps, a little about what you said about the dangers of identifying as a member of a race or an ethnicity, the false distinction. But mm -hmm. there are people who would unembarrassedly say, who would never think of themselves as ethnically or racially based, but would say that they love their country. And you've written about the suffering of your country and the mutilation of it. And, but you've also been 
citizen of or resident of other countries okay. too. What role do you think does love play in this? It's, it's certainly played a huge role in literature, the idea of well, a lot the love me. of, of I mean, la patrie. Couldn't have written Midnight Children without, without feeling uh, love of the place that was being written about. You know, and actually very, very near the end of the novel, and, and actually, if I'm right, at the end of the screenplay. At the end. Um, is, is, uh, is the line where Salim, talking about what he's done, uh, describes it as an act of love. You know, I mean, his, his, his whole writing project the and pickling pickles project. Of history, the pickles of right? yeah. Acts of love. Acts of love. And, and I certainly felt that even when that book was talking about very uh, harsh public material, um, it was written from a point of view of love. You know, um, and and I, I don't think, for me anyway, hatred is not so powerful a motivation as a, you know, to write something. Um, I mean, the novel that followed Midnight's Children, Shame, is, let's, how shall I put it, more critical of Pakistan than Midnight's Children is of India. Um, but it was proper to be so, because Pakistan was a mess. You know? um, and, and, and oddly, with that book, it seems to be more topical oh, yes. today than it was. I mean, mm -hmm. I wrote it, and it, was pub Very much and it was so. published in 1983. You know, and it, it seems to be more topical now than it was then. But I think that's because everything else changed. You know, or as in the wonderful locution of a uh, New York Times journalist, she said, the news agenda has come round to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I thought, well, gosh, lucky me. <laughs> you've, you've always been ahead of the news. As if the but whole did, world turned around. your description there of Pakistan as a house with an east wing and a west wing, mm. and yet somehow haunted house. I mean, you, you were much more prescient, I think, uh, than you strange, realized. Strange. Midnight Children somewhere, I think it said, somebody says that Pakistan is a strange bird, two wings without a body. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Brother, and then yes. one of the wings fell off. It's, um, a, it's a mutation somehow, Pakistan. Yeah, well... Insufficiently imagined is the thing that, in shame, it's described as insufficiently imagined, mm. a failure of the dreaming mind. I mean, this idea that you could construct a country, unite, a, a, unite different parts of a landmass purely on the basis of religious affinity um, was something which was, well, which the secession of Bangladesh, for example, showed was not sufficient. It was not enough. enough. That you know, if you take on the one hand East Bengal and then the Sindh and the Punjab and the Northwest Frontier, these very historically different parts of the world with very different traditions, and try just tell them they're a country because they share one thing. And the name is an acronym. And the name is a is an acronym. Yes, Punjab, Afghanistan, Kashmir. Uh, well, I don't remember what the I is, but S In Indus, S Indus, Sind, Sind. And, and then Balochistan. Balochistan. And then, um, well, before Balochistan, which we're looking, but when you, in the Urdu, which is one of your languages, I think, yes. it, it, it can come out as meaning land of the pure. That's what it means. Which is already a warning no, right there. Land, yes, land of the pure. It's, it's the, no good can yes. come of this. No, no. The, it, the, the, the dry cleaned country. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not surprising oh, that the. Oh, in Pakistan, it was yeah. banned, banned, obviously, banned. You know, yeah. well, uh, because, it was it, because it was criticizing um, a military dictator who was still in power. You know, always a risky move. And, and, and so it was, no, but the funny thing that happened with shame when it came out first was that it got smuggled into Pakistan in very, very large numbers. And, and one of the major means of smuggling it in was the diplomatic pouch. Let's say all these embassies decided that it was required reading for their staffs. And so they started sending bucket loads of shame in through the diplomatic pouch. And when, and, and when the embassy staffs had read it, they sort of disseminated it. And so it was, I mean, it's a very interesting demonstration of how you can't ban a book. I mean, you can, you can try to ban a book, you can declare a book to be banned, but you can't actually ban it. I had a wonderful conversation with an Egyptian Mater D at a restaurant in New York. You know, I went to lunch there and he was very, very excited. I was there and he came up to me and he said, Rushdie, Rushdie. I said, yeah. <laughs> and he said, he said, your book, that book. I read that book. Whenever anybody says that book, there's only one book that they mean. <laughs> so, 
so, so I said, oh, okay, good. I, he said, I, your book, that book, I like that book. Your book. He said, I'm Egyptian, you know. I am from Egypt. I said, good, that's good. He said, you know, in Egypt, he said, your book is totally bad. It's totally bad. He said, but everybody has read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so, I mean, I think, and of course, now with the internet and all that, it, it's actually impossible to ban a text. Mm -hmm. No, I had a, I had a cop take it off me in Pakistan. Did you? And he, he didn't throw it away or toss it or it stopped it in his pocket. Wanted to read it. <laughs> no, no, exactly. Well, there's an interesting story from the early moments of the demonstrations against the satanic verses in London. There was a very big demonstration um, that went along Kensington High Street towards the offices of Viking Penguin, which were just off Kensington High Street, and to demonstrate against the publication of the book. And, and on the high street, there's a very big bookstore, Waterstones Bookstore. Waterstones is like British Barnes and Noble, I guess. And, and they had a huge window display of the book. And somebody I know as a journalist happened to be in the bookstore when the police came in to talk to the bookstore owner to suggest to him that just, you know, for the sake of his window, it might be a good idea to take the books out of the window while the march went past, right? Afterwards, fine, but just, just you know, we don't want any broken glass, just, just take them out during the march. So he did. And the journalist decided that he would go back once the demonstration had dispersed to see if the bookstore had put the books back in the window. And there were no books in the window. So rather irritated, he went to find the bookstore manager and said, look, you know, you weren't told to take them out of the window. He was told to take them out of the window for an hour. Why wouldn't you put them back in? And he said, well, we sold them all. <laughs> 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 and of course, the only people going past the bookstore in the preceding two hours were the demonstrators. <laughs> so they became my readers. Um, it just well, goes well, to show that's good to have critical readers, you know. Uh, I mean, better to have people read the book. I mean, I've always, there was this gentleman, there are many people who insisted on not reading the book in order to object to it. Um, and that was a very widespread problem. And it used to upset me, you know, that people were condemning this book unread. And, and then I thought, if you look at the history of attacks on, on novels, it's almost always the case that those attacking the book do not read it. You know, the people who, who called Lolita obscene um, and its author, a pedophile, had clearly never cracked open that book. And those people who believed astonishingly that James Joyce's Ulysses was pornographic yeah, <laughs> had, right. had obviously not tried it. I mean, Joyce, Joyce's work has many, many qualities but arousing sexual <laughs> lust <laughs> is probably not high on that it's list. A it's a kill. <laughs> so, so it seemed to me that, maybe it's, that it's kind of normal, in fact, when people seek to proscribe a book or to attack a, an author, that they, that they do not familiarize themselves with the thing being attacked. But there's only one exception to that that I know of, which was the Archbishop of Dublin attacking Jonathan Swift for the blasphemies of Gulliver's Travels. He said to his congregation, he'd read every um, book of Gulliver's Travels of his part, didn't believe a word of it. <laughs> 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 Very trenchant critique by his holiness. There's this great fear of stories, isn't there? Should be. Lots of love of stories, great fear of stories. Um, because something's happening in literature. You said the news agenda had come around to you. Um, there's a lot of interest in shame now. There's a lot of interest in Pakistan. This sort of reminds me of something Ezra Pound says, which is literature is news that stays news. Well, it's a, you know that whole relationship, I think, it's, it's a very complicated thing. And, uh, the relationship, it's what you were saying about how do you bring these big public themes you know, into, into books. I, mean, I think there's... It's, it's, it is very difficult, I think, to, to make that uh, decision to incorporate great public matters you know, into, into fiction because, well, first of all, if you write the kind of book that you want to endure, you know, as that Ezra Pound line suggests, the problem with talking about you know, political events, historical events, 
is that in the end, the subject always changes. You know, and, and these days, we live in a very accelerated time in which the subject changes very fast. You know, and and uh, so the great risk of talking about something topical in your book is that when it ceases to be topical, it can in some way damage what you're writing. It will it damage people's reading of the text. It ceases to be so interesting. And I thought, you know, when I wrote Midnight's Children, I thought that. I thought at the climax of the book, there's this thing which was at the time very a matter of great moment, which was Indira Gandhi's uh, so-called emergency, the period in the mid-70s when she suspended democracy, the only time in the history of independent India that democracy was suspended, a sort of period of semi-dictatorship. I don't know why I'm saying semi, really, it's a period of dictatorship. Um, and I remember thinking that one of these days, somewhere down the road, you know, this will be, oh, this will be ancient history. You know, that this won't be something that everybody's so hot under the color about as many of us were at the time. Uh, you know, nobody will really remember or care about the emergency and nobody will even really care about Indira Gandhi that much anymore. And, and, and I remember thinking, what's gonna happen to this book at that time is it will either get worse or better. And, and it'll either get worse because losing that, the force of the topicality you know, will, will damage that last section of the book or it'll get better because it's seen to have like underlying just novelistic architecture, you know, which is in a way revealed by the loss of topicality and which makes the book something that can last. And I truthfully didn't know which would happen. You know, and I mean, I guess the yeah. fact that- And it's, I don't think it's possible to be sure in advance. I mean, no one would now read Marcel Proust, for example, but for his account of the Dreyfus case, no. even though it's the, one of the best that mm -hmm. you can read. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people probably read it not knowing what that subplot is all about. Whereas, uh, but it's an eternal book, no question. Whereas George Orwell wrote 1984 in what he thought it was a fairly short-term battle uh, against communist fellow travelers among the intellectuals. And it'll never die. If only, if only because I think the most terrifying ministry of state in the Big Brother dictatorship is the ministry of love. Yeah, mm. I might add. Well said. Well, yeah. well you know, it's, it's amazing to think that 1984 is a quarter of a century ago. Yes. You know, yeah. um, and, well, and one of the things that didn't happen was the arrival of Big Brother quite as prophesied. Um, you know, England may be many things, but it's, I suppose it almost is Airstrip 1. But you know, in, in 1984, the United Kingdom is known as Airstrip 1 because that's the only function it now serves. Yeah. Um, a landing place for the, for the empire. For the empire of Big Brother. Whereas Dial Press wrote to Orwell when he sent them the, manu the manuscript of Animal Farm and returned it to him with a note, which I, I've got a copy of it somewhere. It says, that, unfortunately, it's impossible to sell animal stories in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to, in order to find this from the, country of, the culture of Disney. In order to find something that Christopher and I might not agree about, uh, the end of 1984, the last sentence of 1984, by the way, since we asked for the first mm, one. Yes. Anyone know the last sentence of 1984? Those who do not, those who do not know the last sentence. Anyway, it's he loved Big Brother. No. Um, that Winston Smith, having gone through all his travails and being put through the horror of Room 101 um, to face the worst thing in the world, and the worst thing in the world for Winston Smith is remember his rats, but. But that's right. not necessarily what you find in Room 101. You just find whatever for you is the worst thing in the world. Um, he is, in fact, broken, you could say, into a condition of love. Um, love for the dictator. And I think clearly the book is a book, and it's, it works at a kind of you know, non-literal level. But the idea that the victory of totalitarianism is total, you know, that, that, that human beings cease to resist totally, you know, that even the last bastion of resistance is broken and, you know, there is an absolute triumph of the dark. It seems to me not to be true about human life. It seems to me not to be true about, about human history or human nature. And it's the one bit of that book that I think, it's too easy. It's too easy because real life is what even, you know, at the worst moment of the Soviet Union, there was never a total mm. defeat of the dissident spirit, you know. And no, and you're right about this, but I remember we, we disagreed about your article 
uh, outside the whale yeah, in Orwell yeah, yeah, some years yeah, ago. Yeah. Because, in my opinion, Orwell writes, a, or rather produces, a picture of complete abject despair at the end of 1984 because he hoped that if it could be imagined, it could be resisted. Mm -hmm. But many people interpreted this as just in itself a concession to despair, which would have destroyed the point of his writing the book. So I, I think I'm right that he was, yeah. but mm -hmm. I, and I think I'm also right in saying that if you wanted to imagine the human personality completely emptied out, broken, denatured, and humiliated, the best way to do it was to say that they loved it, mm. that they loved the way they lived. And I've been to North Korea where love is compulsory mm -hmm. and where the dear leader and the beloved leader and the great leader and so on, the object of not, more than, not just veneration, but adoration, compulsory love, believe mm. me. The, you can't Mao, think about you can't think about love the same way until you've seen it in in action like that. Mao had a go at that too. Yes, yeah. he did. Yeah. Look where involved. he ended up in. Yeah. Yes. But it, it's it's interesting to me. Um, you're talking about how books transcend their immediate context, and that's the point I'm going back to. Midnight's Children not only won the Booker, it won the Booker of Bookers, and then it won the Best of the Booker 40 years later. So yeah. clearly, there was something that just kept ticking. It won the uh, literary prize in Iran, did it not? As well? No, no, shame. Shame. Sorry. Shame. Best novel published in Iran. But they pirated it to begin with. Um, <laughs> Can't have it was been. published by the State Publishing Corporation illegally. I never saw Bean. Um, <laughs> then, they, then they gave it this prize. I never got a prize. <laughs> so it's, it's all, you know. But this is actually. And then uh, love curdled. They're, they're, but, they're, but, you know, the Iranian. Uh, the Ar Iranian ability to offer brickbats and bouquets without there actually being either mm. um, <laughs> extends, in fact, to the fatwa itself. Virtual. Because, because the, a fatwa in Shia law is a legal document. That's to say it has to be, there has to be a piece of paper on which it is written out, which has to be signed by the judge concerned and witnessed and given under seal. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's it's not a scrap of paper. It's a, it's an entity. It's a legal entity. Nobody has ever produced the fatwa. Uh, Khomeini was very close to death at the time. He was actually lying on his deathbed. He was li living in very sequestered circumstances. Very very few people had access to him. Only two or three members of a sort of inner circle, amongst whom prominent amongst whom, was his asshole son, Ahmad Khomeini. <laughs> <laughs> now mercifully deceased, um, like his father. Do not mess with novelists. <laughs> like General Zia. The pen is mightier <laughs> than the yes, sword. Yes. Exactly. Where is General Zia? Anyway, what ha all that happened was that Ahmad Khomeini went to the Iranian television station and from a scrap of paper read out a statement saying that the imam had issued the following fatwa. Nobody's ever, done, nobody's ever produced it. It seems quite possible that the fatwa is a fiction in exactly the same way as the prize given to shame was a fiction. <laughs> <laughs> so first they gave me an award which I didn't get, and then they gave me an attack which didn't happen. You know, it's completely postmodern. It's, it's, it's completely postmodern. I, <laughs> um, <laughs> I might add that I've become a slight friend of Ahmed Khomeini's son. Oh, yes, we, but who... Saeed, switched, I mean, he's a junior, a fairly junior, but interesting cleric in um, Qum, who completely repudiates his grandfather's theory of power, um, uh, absolutely re rejects the doctrine of the Veliati Faki, the idea that the Iranian people belong to the clergy. When he came to my house in Washington, I made him sit in the chair where Salman had sat. And not photographed him, and not at the same time. But it would have been nice if you'd been together. Oh, he and he wrote, <laughs> and he wrote. He could have had a couple. He wrote in the in the flyleaf of my Quran the reasons why and the verses I should look up to show that his grandfather had no right in Islamic law to issue a death sentence against a writer. It sounds like so. Uh, if you live long enough, and if you don't fall in love too easily, <laughs> and if you keep your hatred pure, wonderful things can happen. <laughs> well, as they say, if you, they say. if you sit by the river for long enough, the body of your enemy will float yes, by. <laughs> <laughs> bob, 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 bob. <laughs> in, inshallah, inshallah. inshallah. <laughs> I'm going to try to bring this full circle to the second part of our symposium, which was Imagining uh, Better Worlds. Um, did you folks happen to catch the opening episode of Lost? 
that people watched last year. And um, on this episode, Desmond on the plane was shown holding a copy of Harun and the Sea of Stories. Wow. Um, and there's a blog. People, people who follow these shows are very religious about them. And the blogger um, posted a line, so I tried to explain what was going on with that reference, um, and explained that the point of a uh, big question in Harun and the Sea of Stories was, what's the point of stories that aren't even true? The blogger went on to answer lost answers that they allow us to imagine better worlds. So let me ask you, as somebody who teaches post-colonial literature, which can be a very politicized kind of field, right? Because it's set in a political context. Um, and in my field, the love of literature and the love of the aesthetic is the love that dare not speak its name. Um, and I want to ask you if you, I've actually written a book about this called Native Intelligence. And I'm going to ask you this question post facto, which means I'll probably have to rewrite the book uh. once I hear you talk about it. What's the relationship between aesthetics and politics? How do you write from a place of love? Um, you're talking about these big themes. And what is the point of stories that aren't even true? Well, just first of all, just to correct you very slightly, what's the use of stories that what's aren't even true? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, it's about utilitarianism. You know, um, it's a question often asked about literature is what's it for? You know, and, and I wanted to at least suggest the idea that the point about literature is that it's useless. Um, that it doesn't, it shouldn't be seen functionally. You know, um, what's the use of Alice in Wonderland? You know, it, it doesn't help you fix the fridge. You know, it, it doesn't solve the problems of your life. The, the only use it has, as far as I know, is pleasure. Um, so first of all, the point is that use is the wrong thing to be talking about when you're talking about stories. Um, in the book, it's, of course, it's a question asked by a child angrily of his storyteller father after his mother walks out, claiming that the father has his head in the clouds and does not have his feet on the ground. Um, and the book becomes an, an examination of that relationship between the world of the imagination and the ordinary, everyday world. And I, I, I don't know, I, mean, I have to say, I know nothing about Lost. I uh, wouldn't know what, num what number the flight is, you know, etc. I know all these things are very important. Um, all the characters have numbers, I believe, etc. I mean, forget about it. Um, but I'm happy that they were reading my book, and I hope the Amazon number shoots up. <laughs> that's, 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 that's the number I'm interested in. <laughs> um, um, it seems to me that the relationship between imagination and actuality is much, much closer than we think. Let's put it like this. We all know that things are imagined before they come into being. You know, there is no motor car until somebody imagines a motor car. You know, first, you have to, you have to imagine um, a refrigerator before you can make a re refrigerator. So, so just if, if forget literature, just in terms of making new things, they have to be dreamed before they're made. You know? and, and so the imagination is actually the place where we bring the world into being. Um, and always has been and always will be. Uh, so the imaginative world, the imagined world inside our head, is that place where we make the world outside our head. And, and so it's not some kind of uh, frivolous spare time activity. You know, it, it's, it's not uh, just a, a pastime or a, a means of relaxation. It's actually, whether we are writers or not, you know, it's, it's the thing that we all use to make our lives. You know, um, before you get married, you have to imagine that you might be married. And you have to also think whether that particular person over there would be the person and what she would say if you asked her, and so on. You know, it happens inside you before it happens outside you. You've had to imagine that a few times. Me? No. <laughs> no. No, why would you say a thing like that? No. Um, 
anyway, so that's, I mean, I think that's, that's what I think is that we are creatures defined by our imaginative capacity, and that capacity has allowed us to be the species that we are. You know, um, we wouldn't give annual Nobel Prizes for new discoveries if we were not constantly in the business of making new discoveries. Ah, but I was just waiting for a moment to intervene, and that's it, I think, perfectly, because if, keeping it also within the context of our wider discussion, if anyone here was asked by their friend or partner, um, do you love me, or say you love me, who, who isn't going to feel a slight clutch of that? Okay. Just as if, you're, if someone says, well, what's the use of Shakespeare? Yeah. You think, now, it's kind of the same, both cases, it's if you have to ask, mm. you're either not getting the point or something's gone all right. Some things have to be, so to speak, intuited. And now the Nobel Prize for Literature is to be awarded specifically to a, wor a work of fiction. Actually, it doesn't have to be fiction because mm. Winston Churchill got it uh, of his history, mm. for example, but it's generally fiction. That has elevated the public discourse, uh, contributed to peace and harmony in the world, to democratic, yeah. all the kind of things literature cannot really no, be no. expected to do. It has to be worthy. It's defined out of existence. It's been given to a lot of boring and unworthy people. And if I may say so, hasn't been given to one or two extremely worthy and deserving authors. But just, I, I only instance it because it, it fits with what I was going to say about love and Shakespeare. Don't try. Do not try and define these things. You'll kill it. You will kill it like concrete poetry. You'll kill it. Oh, that's, Emily Dickinson says that love is all there is and that is all we know of love. Mm. Inefficiently translated, I think, by the Beatles as all you need is love. Yes. Yeah. All, with all you require is love. <laughs> it would be more. Can just uh, hear we can start it again. Can <laughs> just hear that. Yes. Oh, well, well, love is all that is required. <laughs> yes. Well, um, I have a feeling they could go on with this forever. Oh, you so, could go on. Don't, um, don't, uh, we should leave it. Don't be in any I was doubt to, about I was that. To, you well, know, we, we are out of his, time. After his poetry recitation, I was going to, uh, I could recite the Walrus of the Carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> of you but, nonsense. Why not? Nonsense. And I'll do the Jabberwock. <laughs> the Jabberwock is too short and easy. Okay, okay. the Walrus is too tough. Up, there's more narrative. Do you want to finish on a nonsense poem? Please. I think that nonsense makes Voila. more sense right. at sun, this point. The sun was shining on the sea. <laughs> It's about the love of oysters, anyway. So it's thematically connected. <laughs> <laughs> the sun was shining on the sea, shining with all its might. It did its very best to make the billows smooth and bright, and this was odd because it was the middle of the night. The moon was shining sulkily because she thought the sun had got no business to be there after the day was done. It's very rude of him, she said, to come and spoil the fun. The sea was wet as wet could be. The sands were dry as dry. You could not see a cloud because no clouds were in the sky. No birds were flying overhead. There were no birds to fly. <laughs> Walrus and the carpenter were walking close at hand. They wept like anything to see such quantities of sand. If this was only cleared away, they said, now wouldn't it be grand if seven maids with seven mops swept it for half a year? Do you suppose, the walrus said, that they could get it clear? I doubt it, said the carpenter and shed a bitter tear. O oh, oysters, come and walk with us, the walrus did beseech, a pleasant walk, a pleasant talk, along the briny beach we cannot do with more than four to give a hand to each. And there's a two lines I can't remember, but the eldest oyster is not impressed by this. Um, <laughs> <you know. laughs> Shook his head, meaning to say he did not choose to leave the oyster bed. Four young oysters hurried up, all eager for the treat. Their Hair was brushed, their faces washed, their shoes were clean and neat, and this was odd because, you know, they hadn't any feet. <laughs> um, four more oysters hurried up, and yet another four, and thick and fast they came at last, and more and more and more, all scrambling through the frothing waves, uh, hopping through the fro frothing waves and scrambling to the shore. The walrus and the carpenter walked on a mile or so, and then they rested by a rock, conveniently low, and all the little oysters stood and waited in a row. Time has come, the walrus said, to speak of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, of why the sea is boiling hot and whether pigs have wings. 
But wait a bit, the oysters cried before we have our chat, for some of us are out of breath and all of us are fat. <laughs> no hurry, said the carpenter. They thanked him much for that. A loaf of bread, the walrus said, is what we chiefly need. Pepper and vinegar, besides, are very nice indeed. Now, if you're ready, oysters, dear, we can begin to feed. <laughs> but not on us, the oysters cried, turning a little blue. After such kindness, that would be a dismal thing to do. The night is fine, the walrus said. Do you admire the view? It was so good of you to come, and you are very nice. The carpenter said nothing but, cut us another slice. I wish you were not quite so deaf. I've had to ask you twice. <laughs> Seems a shame, the walrus said, to play them such a trick after we brought them out so far and made them trot so quick. <laughs> the carpenter said nothing but the butter spread too thick. I weep for you, the walrus said. I deeply sympathize. With sobs and tears, he sorted out those of the largest size, holding his pocket handkerchief before his streaming eyes. Well, oysters, dear, the walrus said, we've had a pleasant run. Shall we be trotting home again? But answer came there none. And this was scarcely odd because they'd eaten every one. Oh. <laughs> Bravo. 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 Tragedy, comedy. <laughs> yes. That's an History. act of love, to read that closely and to remember. Uh, let me thank you all for coming to Emory. You who came for love of Salman. Sure. You who came to talk to us and about him and to the audience. You who came to listen, listening to an act of love. Thank you very thank much. You. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.